The title of my talk is uh, uh, Israel-Palestine Prospects for Peace, something like the Prospects for Peace in Israel-Palestine, but I'd like to begin by talking about doubt. As an educator in the university, it's obvious that you, uh, or at least to me it's obvious, that you want your students to doubt the world around them. And f just for intellectual reasons, you need doubt to be an intellectual. But I also think that you need doubt to live a moral life. You need to constantly doubt what you're seeing, what's going around you, what, what people tell you, and so forth. And um, I've begun to doubt myself. And I want to share with you a bit of the doubts that I've been going through in the past year or so about my positions regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And in this way, I feel that, uh, you know, I'm a small person, but I'm following the great Jewish tradition, uh, the most holy of holy holidays for the Jews is Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, we read the book of Jonah. And Jonah is the prophet that doubts and defies God. And we read it on the most holy day because doubt and defying even God is considered important in Judaism. <clears throat> now, my doubts emerged one day early in the morning when I woke up we have this really small bed that I share with my wife. And I woke up, and right there by my side, I saw, so to speak, Benjamin Netanyahu. Now, the man is a big man, and we have this small bed. And, you know, I was kind of flabbergasted. What is Benjamin Netanyahu doing in my bed? And, you know, I've been at it for 30 years or so. I'm 45 going to be next month. I've been at it since I was 14, 15. And, you know, Netanyahu is the political rival in this historic moment. And I couldn't understand how is it that this man is now going everywhere and saying, that he believes in the two-state solution. We've been fighting for the two-state solution for 30 years, 40 years. And here now, the Prime Minister of Israel, the leader of the Likud party, comes to the US, goes to Bar Ilan, and says, I'm for the two-state solution. And I've always been for the two-state solution. And I started to think, you know, one way to think of it is, is just to criticize him. But the other way to think of it is maybe, maybe Netanyahu is right and I'm wrong. You know, because I was thinking either this could be a dream. It was early in the morning. And so I pinched myself. I didn't wake up. I was awake. It hurt. And the Messiah was nowhere in town. So it, it must be something is wrong with me. And I started thinking that maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should doubt my uh, political positions. And I think it's important for all of us that are out there struggling every day for a certain cause to be willing also to stay, take a step back and think whether we are uh, right or we are wrong. And in the past year, I've changed my mind, and here I'm serious about several things about this conflict and, and what we should do about it. And I'd like to briefly uh, talk about that. How, how long is this session? An hour from when? Okay, till 1.15. So basically what I'll do is this. I'll very briefly go over what I think are three possibilities that can happen. And I'll mention what 
I've held as what I thought would be the correct possibility, and then I'll try to point out why I think I was mistaken. And so the three major possibilities regarding these conflict are maintaining the status quo, and I call this also the one state solution number one, by which I mean two things. One is that the status quo is not a status quo. And anyone that talks about status quo will soon see that it's, it's a changing situation. And the change is, is, is with us constantly. And the one state solution number one is what I call a full-blown apartheid regime. The second possibility is the two-state solution. I think it's much less probable than the status quo. Status quo is the highest probability. And the third possibility is what's called the binational state or the one state solution number two. And I'd like to go over them very briefly and then let's figure out maybe what we should be for. The one state or the status quo is a de facto one state because uh, uh, we have a prison on the south which is the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and uh, is totally the Palestinians and Jews are totally enmeshed together. We have de jure and from a legal perspective two states in terms of the international community it recognizes the green line uh, as the international border of Israel, and yet on the ground it is a one-state solution, a one-state in existence. We have two legal systems in this area, this one state from the Jordan Valley to the Mediterranean. The Jews live under one legal system, the Jews and the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And uh, the three, three and a half million Palestinians that are occupied live under another legal system. There's no diplomatic initiatives, or at least no diplomatic initiatives, that are worthy of discussing here. There's continuing conflict on the ground. There's continuing Israeli buildup in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And there's a continuing siege on the Gaza Strip. This situation is highly likely to continue, and even more likely, I would like to suggest here today, if we support the two-state solution, and they're related. The, the likelihood of it continuing is dependent on, certain, on levels of violence, on external pressure, which we don't see much of, and on the internal politics on both sides, which both sides, it's dismal. The consequences of this ongoing status quo, which I said is not really a status quo because it's constantly t changing, because Israel is constantly deepening every day its control over the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Look at what's going now in East Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah and other neighborhoods. In reality, we do not have a static status quo because that's what status quo is. It's static. We have a, an oxymoron, a dynamic status quo. And the idea of this status quo is to create facts on the ground. It's to deepen the colonial project. That's the idea of the status quo. And these facts on the ground are producing a full-blown apartheid. Now, people have been uh, critical of me when I compare Israel to an apartheid regime. They say Israel is not South Africa. Duh. <laughs> you know, it's not South Africa because these are two different situations. But the United States and Italy and India are not the same either. Apartheid is a regime type. It's not a state. And there are many differences and important differences between Israel and South Africa. But when two people live in the same territory under two legal systems, I call that apartheid. 
and, and I've been misquoted, and I'd like to set the record straight. People have understood me to say that there's apartheid in the occupied territories. That is not what I mean. There's apartheid in the territory between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean Sea. That's what I mean. Um, <clears throat> because it is one state. Because in reality, it is one state. Now, so this status quo is creating this full-blown apartheid, and it's creating a situation um, that the, whereby the two-state solution is less and less of an option. Now, you'll see, I disagree, I think he's here, I haven't seen him yet, uh, with Jeff Halper on this. He says the two-state solution is no, not an option, but we'll get that to that in a minute. What does the two-state solution entail? We are lucky. We've had several international uh, 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 proposals for the two-state solution. And basically, if you look at these proposals, there's differences between them, but basically they say the same thing. They say there's three conditions for the two-state solution. For the two-state solution to happen, you need to meet three conditions. One is a withdrawal to the 1967 borders with possible one-for-one -one land swaps. Two is a recognition of the right of return, and it could be with a stipulation, or it should be probably, I think, with a stipulation that this is a full right of return on a de jure level, on a legal level, but it's an actual right of return where only a symbolic amount of Palestinian you return to the state of Israel and the rest can return to the Palestinian state or receive compensation. Three, it's a division of Jerusalem, including the holy sites. Once these three conditions are met, and they're more complicated and so forth, but these are the basic outlines of the conditions for a two-state solution, there will be a two-state solution. Now, what are the obstacles to these two-state solutions? One is geography. We're living in one state. The Jewish population and the Palestinian population in the West Bank and East Jerusalem are totally enmeshed. We have almost half a million Jews living now on uh, territories that were occupied in 1967. And remember, the withdrawal from Gaza Strip was 8,000 Jews. We're talking half a million. Two, we have a very strong, political, powerfully political settler population that is against uh, uh, the two-state solution. We have a political configuration, both within Israel, the Israeli government and uh, the Palestinian, two governments actually, uh, that will make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to reach a two-state solution. And we have major disagreement, if not on the withdrawal to the 1967 borders, on the religious site in East Jerusalem and regarding the refugee uh, issue. The precipitating factors of the two-state solution are that the Palestinians in the West Bank particularly want sovereignty now. They know they can get it in the long run, but they've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and they don't want to wait another 50 years. Maybe the diaspora Palestinians are willing to wait, but the Palestinians in the West Bank and many in the Gaza Strip that are suffering the hardships of daily life would prefer to have it now. There are Jewish demographic fears. Today, between the Jordan Valley and, uh, and, and the Mediterranean Sea, the Jews are about 50% of the population. Jews are afraid that they will lose the demographic majority. And there's a supposedly economic incentives that 
to Israel and to the Palestinians. The Palestinians, if there'll be a two-state solution, the siege will break. And if there'll be a two-state solution, the Arab countries in the region will be buyers of Israeli products and services. But and there's a majority, according to the polls, both in Israel and in the occupied territories, for the two-state solution. And yet, it doesn't happen. And not only it doesn't happen, every day, as I said, we're getting further and further away from this solution. In order for it to happen, what would need, first, a coalition between pragmatic forces in Hamas and the young Fatah, which would mean people like Ismail Ania and Marwan Barghouti. Marwan Barghouti is in jail and Ismail Ania doesn't have much power in Hamas. We would need massive external pressure on Israel to accept such a solution. And this, I think, includes the BDS. We would need a strong coalition inside Israel that would support such agreement. We have a few thousand that actually support it. And hardly any political parties that support it. So basically, it is really, really, really highly unlikely that it's going to happen anytime soon. Now, the one state solution number two is the binational state. And people, you know, it's become a buzzword in, in, in certain circles, but hardly anyone's really talking about what the binational state would mean. The only people that are really taking it seriously, I think, that are really talking about it and what it means are the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And they've written three, I don't know, many of you probably haven't, even haven't heard of it, but they've written three documents, visionary documents, of what a binational state would mean. But most people are just saying binationalism and are, are not really spelling it out. And when we think of binationalism, we often think of the South African model. And the South African model will not work in Israel-Palestine. The South African model, as Miron Ben Benisti recently pointed out in a, a wonderful article in Haaretz, is the liberal democratic model. It's the one man, one vote model. Separation of powers and free elections. And this is not the model that will work in Israel-Palestine. And when we, we shouldn't just say a democracy for all its citizens because that's not going to solve the problem. We should think seriously of what a binational model would mean. And I'll just spell out, kind of give you a thumbnail sketch of two or three things that I think it would mean, and then uh, spell out where I stand today. A binational model, for it to work in the context of Israel-Palestine, would have to have, I think, four central ingredients. One <clears throat> is the preservation of the international borders, by which I mean not the real international borders now, which are the 1967 borders, but the de facto international borders, by which I mean from the Jordan Valley to the Mediterranean Sea. Within this chunk of land will be the binational state. Within this chunk of land, there'll be soft borders or porous borders where people can move in and out of freely. And these borders will divide, you can call it counties, you can call it districts, whatever you want, the areas of Jews and Palestinians whereby each side maintains its ethnic, cultural, religious identity, has schools that educate according to this values and traditions of the ethnic group, has, let's say, municipal governance 
where they control that part of the county. But on the federal level, it's a power-sharing agreement, S much like maybe the Lebanese case, whereby the, 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 there is equal power-sharing between the two sides, and uh, uh, so it doesn't really matter the demography. One side can suddenly become bigger than another, or greater than another side. They'll still have power sharing. So it's a kind of soft distinction geography. It's an ability to have what the Irish, and Miron Benvenisti mentions is created a parity of esteem where each side basically uh, accepts and respects the culture, the religion, the traditions of the other side, allows them, the other side, the other ethnic group, to celebrate it. And they, there's these soft borders where certain issues are more privileged in certain areas, but people can pass freely. And there's this power sharing on the federal level. This is a binational state we can start talking about. Now, for years I was against the binational state. And the reason I was against binational state that I thought that Hegel was smarter than Marx on this issue. What do I mean Hegel was smarter than Marx on this issue? I mean that, yes, Jeff Halper and uh, Meron Ben Benisti and all those that have come and said that the facts on the ground preclude a two-state solution. Yes, the facts on the ground, it, the Jews and Palestinians are totally enmeshed, but that's geography, that's the material force. Against that stood the ideology. And the Jewish ideology is that the binational state is the destruction of the state of Israel. It's the destruction of the Jewish state. And therefore, the ideology was so strong against the binational model that no one in Israel, except for two handful of Jews, would accept it. And I said to myself for years that ideology is more powerful than geography, that Hegel is more powerful than Marx. And therefore, we need to, for strategic level reasons, to try to advance the two-state solution for strategic, because that is the most possible solution in this mo historic moment. And for years, that is what I argued for, because for, at this historic moment, if we want some kind of solution, we can't wait forever, we need to support the two-state solution. And then I woke up next to Netanyahu. And it is clear to everyone, I hope, in this room that when I talk about the two-state solution and when Netanyahu talks about the two-state solution, we're talking about totally different things. I know that. I'm not stupid. I talked about those three conditions that I just mentioned. And Netanyahu talks about something else. Meron ben Benisti explained what he talked about. And I want to read this paragraph by Meron ben Benisti because I can't say it better than he did. And he said that the kind of sovereignty Netanyahu thinks of when he thinks of a Palestinian state is a scattered sovereignty. It's lacking any cohesive physical infrastructure with no direct connection to the outside world and limited to the height of its residential buildings and the depth of its graves. The airspace and water resources will remain under Israel control. Helicopter patrols, the airwaves, the hands on the water pumps and the electrical switches, the registration of residents and the issue of identity cards, as well as the passes to enter and leave, will con be controlled either directly or indirectly by Israel. This ridiculous caricature of a Palestinian state beheaded and with no feet, future, or any chance of development 
is pre presented as the fulfillment of the goal of symmetry and equality embodied in the old slogan, two states for two people. It is endorsed even by staunch supporters of the greater Israel and the traditional peace camp rejoices it in its triumph. So this is the two-state solution that Netanyahu is thinking of when he says that he supports the two-state solution. Now, of course, I could come and explain the two-state solution I've been fighting for is radically different than the two-state solution that Netanyahu is arguing for and that the people that here that support the two-state solution are arguing for. But we have to understand something very important about the use of language in politics. And that is that the two-state solution has been co-opted. It's been co-opted by the radical right. And yes, we don't want them to co-opt it. And yes, we want it to be ours. But that's not how politics works. Politics works through propaganda and through the use and abuse of language. And we have to take that into consideration. And so what, what situation has Netanyahu created? And we have to take it extremely serious. He's created a situation where support of the two-state solution is support of the status quo. Support of the two-state solution is support of the status quo. Because we know what his end product will look like. It's full-blown apartheid. That's his two-state solution. So long as we support now this agenda, and that's what the politicians are talking about, we're supporting that. And therefore, the discourse has to be changed. And it has to move from a discourse of status quo to two-state solution to a discourse of what binational means today. Thank you very much. I'll take a few questions.